I'm old enough to have uh, been born when the first transistor was made, probably in the early 50s when my next door neighbour had a, a homemade television set. I became really interested in electronics and particularly in electronics for audio. And that eventually led me through the 60s when I did effects units for pop groups and things like that into electronic music. The future was going to be digital. I made my first DAC system, which was a 12-bit DAC, which ran on a 12-bit computer called a PDP-8, uh, actually in an IC form from Intersub. By the end of the 70s, we'd acquired a PDP-11 16-bit computer, and we needed, but couldn't buy, a DAC output system for that. So I designed a 16-bit four-channel DAC output system. The next stage, I guess, was the appearance of the Composer's Desktop project here at York, and we had to design our own digital interface, which was called the DAT DAC, because it interfaced to a DAT machine and had a DAC in it. It didn't have any ADCs. We were cooperating with Audio Design to help produce the interface that I've designed for the Atari. And they said to me, well, why don't you design us an A to D? A good A to D, 16-bit or 18-bit. And I did. It was part of their Sound Maestro digital audio editor. So we were producing an A to D called the PB4. It was really aimed at the broadcast environment. That led in turn to Focusrite approaching me uh, via audio design to design them a version of it with much better analog circuitry. And that was the start of the Focusrite Blue 245. That would have been 1995. Um, we had it working, at least in a pre-production format, by February of 96. And it was fully re released uh, probably about a Easter of that year. I'm not quite sure if my memory doesn't go back that well. Uh, we certainly made a big fuss of it at the AES Copenhagen um, convention in May 1996. Uh, we had the thing on the stand. We had uh, the a paper about it detailing some of the design, but not of all, all of the design. We kept a few tricks up our sleeve. It was really aimed at the mastering environment, so we'd done fairly obvious things, like we'd removed the switched gain system and uh, replaced it with a pot. Well, uh, the paper was uh, an interesting one. It was one of the most technical I'd done. And I looked at all kinds of things. I looked at the very considerable importance of getting ground planes right on PC boards, uh, getting the power supplies right, and getting them really clean. Um, a lot of people up to that time had been really concerned about getting the analog power supplies clean, but we identified the need to actually make sure the digital ones were really clean as well. That was because the noise from the power supply that was digital had a tendency to leak in the analog, into the analog side. So we were very careful about that. We didn't use switch mode supplies. Uh, we didn't use onboard microprocessors. Everything was done with static logic. The reason for that is that if you use microprocessors, if you use switch mode supplies, you've got a whole extra set of clocks in the environment, which is already quite noisy, and which can get into the analog circuits. If it gets into the analog circuits, it can get into the A to D. So what were your personal goals as far as the design of this uh, unit were concerned? What were you aiming at? I think just doing the best job I possibly could on that. Not just hitting a target, which we've done before for audio design and for a Composed desktop project, but really actually making the absolute best I could without breaking the bank in terms of making something which cost multi thousands to produce. So I was really pleased to be approached by. No, not just pleased. I was um, what's the word? Honoured 
to be approached by somebody with the reputation of focus right? Yeah, I think honoured is the right word. What do you think are the primary factors that determine the quality of a conversion system? Mm. That's actually quite difficult. I would, I would say that the one that most people looked at then, um, still do I think, is noise. But that is probably not as important as getting good audio quality and particularly low distortion. Board design was very important and that's where the simulation software would have been really useful. Because basically we were really guessing at what would do well. Okay, we had knowledge. We had knowledge that you didn't run anything to do with the digits anywhere near the analog circuitry or at least anywhere nearer than you could possibly avoid but we didn't have any way of checking this except to build the board um, and so there was an element of luck in the design which there's far less of these days if you've got the right tools well some of the primary factors basically are out of the box designer uh, command. I mean, the, these days, A to Ds are produced by a manufacturer somewhere way away from where you're working usually, and you have no influence on the internals of the chip. But others are very important and are under the command of the designer. And particularly, again, it's the quality of the audio analog audio side and things like the board design and the power supplies uh, and they're the I think the really important factors because they all end up giving you a better dynamic range in the end with lower distortion at the higher levels and lower noise and uh, yeah I think you need to really work on that side of things so what are the design criteria that anybody designing a decent system needs to uh, need to look at well the really things we talked about already things like board design power supply design component selection in particular it's no good doing a brilliant design for your PC board and having wonderful power supplies if for instance you don't buy a good A to D chip in the first place so you need to look carefully at the fairly small number of manufacturers of high quality A to Ds. You need to look for the best in their catalogues and then you need to actually listen to them in their um, evaluation boards and really see if they are better. Just because something says it's got a 127 dB of dynamic range doesn't miss it, mean it's going to perform like that in a real system. So you need to be very careful. You need to actually really look and, more importantly, listen to these things. It's actually been exciting looking back at the old design I did and looking at what's coming up in the future and thinking, wow, I wish we'd known that then. In many ways, Getting the best out of a conversion system is no different from getting the best out of an ordinary analog audio system. You need to get your signal levels right. You need to make sure that everything you do is clean, except where you want to mess up the sound deliberately. So I don't think there's anything, any particular magic, provided you buy decent gear in the first place, provided you know how to set levels, how to me to things and how to listen to things you'll get good results this is important because a lot of the stuff we're doing particularly in mastering range things will go into archives and if you don't put good stuff into the archives in the first place you're not going to get good stuff out of them in the end we're seeing now advances in theories based on psychoacoustics based on neuroscience which enable us to aim our systems much more at the capabilities of the human ear. Not just a hard engineering thrust to 
improve the dynamic range, but actually to improve it in a way which would sound better to our ears.